It is, exactly, because, you know, the hamstring is a mobilizer muscle. It's, it's designed to move you forwards primarily. That's that's its primary function. It's biarticular, which, again, tells you that its, it's uh, role is primarily to move. And yet it's being asked to stabilize. And so, like you say, it's, it's, it's having to sort of hold tension, but at the same time move. Um, and, and that is essentially two, two different roles, which no wonder it gets worn down right, and stressed. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's episode, I spoke with my good friend and colleague, Matt Warden, the head of the Czech Institute faculty, about hamstring strains. Matt completed his thesis on hamstring strains in elite football players as part of his master's degree in osteopathy over 20 years ago and has consulted with elite sports teams such as Chelsea Football Club and Wasps Rugby Football Club, as well as elite British sprinters. So who better to discuss the hows, whats and whys of hamstring strains, how to prevent them and how to rehabilitate from them than Matt. If you're into sports, exercise or if you have a hamstring injury, this episode is for you. Matt Warden, welcome back to the Radical Health Report podcast. Thanks for coming back on. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> That's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, to kick things off, for those who haven't yet listened to episodes 13 and 14, where we discussed the purpose and potential of persistent pain, could you share a little bit of your background and how you became interested in hamstring strains? Yeah, yeah. Well, hamstring strain was actually what I did for my master's thesis back in the, the 90s. Um, and it was inspired really by the Michael Owen mm. debacle at the time where Michael Owen, uh, you know, for those that don't know, he was uh, a very good English footballer in the England team, in the Liverpool team. In fact, got the Ballon d'Or. So he was the best, considered the best player in the world, 2001. I think, in 2000, like that. Yeah. 2001. Okay, I'm glad you've done your research. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, the, the tragedy in some ways is that he was such an excellent player, but he kept getting hamstring strains. And um, in one season, he got six hamstring strains. And um, so, I, you know, I was disappointed for him. And, and uh, you know, when I started to look into it as a potential subject for my thesis, what I found was that it wasn't just him, but actually a lot of people get recurrent hamstring strains. And it's the most common injury across all sports, but also uh, it's the most com- common injury in professional football. And that was an area... I was quite keen to get involved with. So I thought, well, this is a really good thing to study, partly for that reason, but partly also because it seems that most of the research and the sort of inside line I had from from some of the uh, medical team at the FA is that a lot of the medical teams at that point in time were very much treating the hamstring locally. So they're just kind of, you know, rubbing the hamstring and strengthening the hamstring and stretching the hamstring and, and this kind of thing, which wasn't very congruent with my osteopathic training at the time, which is more holistic. And so, you know, you would you would think about looking outside of the hamstring for why it's getting strains. Um, but that certainly wasn't really present in the literature. There were a couple of papers that, that, that sort of alluded to that, but most of the papers didn't have anything about it. It was all local to the hamstring. And... Um, like I say, I had a bit of an inside line that, that it wasn't really being considered at Liverpool Football Club, which which is where Mike Lowen was. So that kind of, you know, spurred me on to look into it and to see if it also would provide me with a channel to, to get involved with professional sports as well. So that was the, the backdrop to it. Um, uh, do, you, do you want me to go any further back or further uh, forwards? Well, or? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting because just last week I saw an interview with Michael Owen being interviewed by Simon Jordan. So Simon, oh, Jordan, right, okay. I don't know who he is. He he's a multi or former multimillionaire. I think he still is a multimillionaire, and he's on a, a radio station called Talk Sport in the UK, and he has a podcast as well where he interviews mainly sports people. And he interviewed Michael Owen, and Michael mm. Owen was saying about. Um, and for the listeners who don't know, he was absolutely super quick as well. Like if he hadn't have been. An, a soccer player, he probably could have been a sprinter. It was, you know, ridiculously quick. Uh, 
And mm. he was saying that when he was 19, so, so sorry, he burst onto the scene when he was 17. So he was playing senior level mm. football at 17, played for England at 18. And it was when he was 19 that he completely ruptured his hamstring. Now, which one it was, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm guessing it's probably the long head of the biceps for Morris from what he was saying. And right. he was saying basically he had a bundle of muscle at the top of his leg. He had a bundle of muscle at the bottom of his leg. And back then they didn't they didn't do attachment resurgery. They just left it. So, wow. So he was obviously dealing with, you know, two two long hamstrings on one leg and three on the other leg. And he was saying it just called, mm. caused massive imbalance in his body. So that'd be quite useful as we mm -hmm. go through this, that, that we might be able to refer back to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. To kind of finish off the, the Michael Owen story to a degree over the next seven years, he was just constantly getting injured. And then in 2006 in the world cup, when he was playing for England, he ruptured his, Achilles, his uh, anterior cruciate ligament, That's which funny, again, yeah. we're probably yeah. going to come on to talk about anterior, anterior cruciate ligaments as well. Yes, yeah, so I expect so. It's all part of the story. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting you said that because, you know, the uh, the biceps femoris, which is that lateral hamstring on the outside of the leg, uh, is injured somewhere between two times as much, up to as much as 10 times as much as the medial hamstring. So for some reason, it seems to be massively injured, more more so than the others. Um, and interesting enough, is, is it, the, the, the biceps is called the biceps because mm -hmm. it's got two heads. And the long head is the one that goes from the hip right the way down to, to just below the knee. And then the short head is the one that goes from, from the femur just, just down below the knee. So it just spans one joint. But it's often around the muscular tendinous junction where those two heads meet, mm. where it tears. Which is, And it sounds very much like that was mm. the likely scenario with Michael mm. Owen. Yeah, so I just yeah. want to roll back a little bit before we roll forwards. So okay. just so that just so all the listeners are fully on board with what we're discussing and everyone can follow along. Can you explain mm -hmm. what and where the hamstrings are on the body and also what their functions are? Cause obviously they've got a lot of functions as well, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. And the funny thing about that is that I, uh, so I was doing my master's degree and obviously exploring the hamstrings and looking quite deeply into it. And, um, uh, I went on a, a core stability course. It was just probably about 1999. And so, so it was still, you know, it was quite a new thing and, Swiss balls and this kind of thing. It wasn't. It wasn't with Paul Check actually. It was with someone here in the UK. And um, I remember being in this group with uh, with the sports therapist. And the sports therapist was saying, "Well, you know, not a lot of people know that the hamstrings not only flex the knee, but they extend the hip." <laughs> and, and I was thinking, oh, "Right, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> fair enough. Maybe that's true. But they have a whole bunch of other functions as well. And so, uh, you know, one of one of the key ones is that that they posteriorly tilt the pelvis." Um, but they also, via the, the, the tendon, so the tendon of, of the biceps femoris in particular, but also one of the other hamstrings, the semi-tendinosis, uh, which is one of the medial hamstrings, those fibers actually insert into uh, a ligament, which is called the sacrotubulus ligament, which I know you know all about, um, but it runs from the, the, the uh, sitting bone, um, which is called the ischial tuberosity, up to the sacrum, so sacrotuberous. Um, and, and what research back in the 90s found was that actually in some cases the hamstring doesn't even insert into the pelvis it just goes straight into this ligament and the ligament goes right the way up to the sacrum so this was one of the things i was interested in as well do people with sacroiliac issues end up with hamstring strain as a result of the sacroiliac issue so something outside the hamstring is actually causing the stress onto the hamstring which is why it keeps recurring so that's that's a topic in and of itself but you know in conjunction with that that role it actually does stabilize the sacroiliac joint so so it will not only stabilize by helping to posteriorly tilt the pelvis which which tends to lock that sacroiliac joint but it also uh, and that's called form closure um but it also spans across the sacroiliac joint via its fascial attachments the connective tissues there and um and, and so that creates what's called force closure when the hamstring contracts it actually creates force through the joint and stabilizes that joint as you essentially load it in running or jumping or whatever so so that's another couple of functions there um but at the other end it, it also um controls rotational um movement of the tibia and so um you know when you plant your so, foot to so turn tibia, for example the shin bone. Yeah. bone yeah exactly yeah so so if you were to to sort of lunge in one direction and turn 
like like is very common in football or in most ball sports, of course, uh, and in lots of other activities of, of daily living. Well, as you turn, of course, you're putting rotational stresses through the knee. And in fact, um, if I recall the stats, um, the average footballer, this is this would be a professional footballer, turns their knee through 45 degrees 250 to 350 times per game. So it's a lot of rotation through the knee. And rotation through the knee actually is very um, stressful to the knee. Of course, it's designed to rotate. It's, it's evolved to rotate. But um, but it puts a lot of torsional stress into the, the menisci, which is the cartilage, um, but also into the ligamentous system, and in particular the cruciates. Uh, anterior cruciate tends to be the one that, that takes the, the, the biggest load uh, for mo- most of the time, which we can explain more about later. But so, you know, the hamstrings, I, the way I simplify it is to say that the hamstrings really function a bit like the reins on a horse. If you imagine the tibia, the shin bone is like the horse's head and the hamstrings are like a re- the reins on it. So you've got the lateral hamstring, the biceps femoris on the outside. You've got the medial two hamstrings, the semimembranosus and semitendinosus on the inside, where they kind of work like reins on a horse to help control that rotational loading. So that's very important. Uh, that's perhaps one of the most important uh, functions of the hamstrings. Um, also, the semimembranosus, uh, I believe, um, attaches into the medial meniscus, and so it retracts the medial meniscus as you flex the knee. So that helps to essentially kind of, if you imagine the meniscus is like a flat piece of connective tissue that sits on top of the, the shin bone, on top of the tibia, is, is essentially the, the bottom of the knee joint. Um, well, it turns out that, of course, it's, it's, it's somewhat pliable. And when that uh, semimembranosus contracts, what it does is it pulls on on the uh, meniscus so that it flattens it out. So that it's kind of strung tight, like a, like a, uh, I guess a drum skin that's been pulled tight. So, so that then the, the femur rolls nicely across it as you twist or turn or, or, or load it. Um, so, of course, if you've got any kind of dyssynergic firing, which means uh, that the muscle isn't firing at the right time, you know, it's slightly late or it's slightly early, then that can really disrupt meniscal function or cartilage function in the knee. So that's another element. And but you know, another thing that we've alluded to already is that the the biceps femoris which is this most injured of the hamstring, it actually has a similar line of pull um, to the, or I should say a similar line of tensioning to, to the anterior cruciate ligament. And so it's it's highly protective of the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, and it's, it's known as a dynamic agonist. So in other words, it, you know, it can contract, obviously a ligament can't contract. The muscle can contract, so it's dynamic. An agonist means it supports the function of that ACL. And so if you've got an issue with the hamstring, you're much more likely to get an ACL tear. And if you get an ACL tear, then you want your hamstrings to be optimized as best they can. So that's one of the key things we'd look at in rehabilitation if someone's had an ACL tear. So so there's, there's some of the additional functions of the yeah, of I'm hamstrings. I'm sure there's a few more that we might even cover as, as we go through. As probably. Well. Yeah. But that's probably a good yeah, yeah. overview for now in the hamstrings. But yeah, yeah some of those concepts we might we might go into a bit more detail. Um, yeah, yeah and this is just really um, i'm just setting the scene as well a little bit for the hamstring and this is something that i learned from you actually and i'd love you to explain is mm. the different role of hamstrings in humans compared to other animals generally and also other bipedal animals yeah well so i mean obviously one of the things that it does is is it, it it's it, the, the hamstrings fire uh very strongly the minute you start to, to bend forwards and so um, you know, if you think we are bipeds and uh, therefore we, we do spend a lot of our time bending forwards to pick things up or to get into cars or get into seats, well, the hamstrings really fire in that instance. And if, you, if we take another sport like rugby, for example, one of the most common mechanisms for injury in rugby of the hamstrings is picking up the ball from the ground whilst running. You know, so the ball's bobbling along the ground. And of course, you know, it's often uh, one of the, the defenders, you know, is bending down to, to pick it up or the backs, I should say, um, pick, to pick it up. And as they flex whilst running, then boom, their hamstring goes. Um, and so that's an example of the hamstring really contracting strongly in that forward bend, but also being asked to propel that person forwards and stabilize the joint and stabilize, the, you know, the, the SI joint and, and stabilize the knee joint. So, so you know, it has multiple roles. Um so, uh, so you know, if we then compare that to, to a quadruped, um, then a quadruped's hamstrings are, um, they're not nearly as, um, 
demanded the, the, the demand on them is is a lot lower um because you know they haven't got the trunk essentially ha- hanging off the hamstring um you know in a bipedal position so so yeah i mean also there, there's other differences such as you know the the glutes are far more developed in humans if they're well conditioned of course and this is another reason why people get hamstring strains is their glutes yeah. are deconditioned um but a well conditioned set of glutes should protect you from hamstring strain because the glutes also are involved in holding you upright very much so but also very much involved in in uh, stabilizing the low back and, and propelling you forwards and controlling rotation of the lower limb so when you get this deconditioning of the glutes, which is very, very common, even in elite sports, um, surprisingly, um, but uh, you get, when, when I say deconditioning, probably to qualify that a bit, it's kind of a relative deconditioning compared to, say, the quads. And uh, we often talk about something called quad dominance, where and that's essentially where the quads are overactive compared to the glutes. And you find that all the time in sports people for, for various reasons. Um, but um, but those are some of the some of the key differences uh, that spring to mind. Yeah, Is there anything else that you, yeah, you were thinking yeah, of? <laughs> just the second half of the question was also the difference between the function of the hamstrings in a human compared to other bipedal animals. So, like, for instance, you might talk about dinosaurs. You might talk about birds, for instance. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so, so um, well, yeah, and it's interesting, actually, because there aren't, there aren't too many bipedal creatures, it turns out. So, so um, you know, of course, there's lots of animals that can go on their hind legs, but they won't do it habitually, you know, and, and so that's the definition of, of bipedal. So, you know, you've got, I forget the name, of there's a kind of deer type creature in, in Africa that will, will stand on its hind legs and feed on its hind legs. But to move, to walk, it's always on all fours. Um, kangaroos, you know, they, they spend a lot of time on their hind legs, but they actually use their tails and they'll sometimes go down on all fours as well. So they're not technically bipeds either. So their locomotion is really using their tail and their legs. So really, you've only got two species that, that we know of that are true bipeds, and that's birds. Um, and the thing with birds is that they've actually changed the orientation of their trunk. So their pelvic viscera, so the, the organs that are in the pelvis, have shifted backwards. And I think it's always quite funny to, to imagine how a child would draw a bird. You know, if you think of a bird, how you draw it like a stick diagram, you'd have the legs in the middle, and you'd have this kind of oval on a slight angle just above and so the, the pelvic viscera are behind the legs and uh, and it's the same well it's, it's slightly different with, with the dinosaurs the dinosaurs actually used a, a large counterbalancing tail so dinosaurs like the tyrannosaurus um they had a huge counterbalancing tail so essentially they would use that passive means of, of loading behind the legs to lift them upright um but one of the things that uh, a guy called serge grakovetsky described was that we were the first species to come up on our hind legs and actually use a muscular or an active way of standing up uh so we we don't have anything behind our midline that holds us up we, we use mm. we use muscles you know we don't have a, a, like a passive counterbalance so we use that posterior chain of muscles which is often talked about in uh, strength conditioning you know the posterior chain uh and all these posterior chain exercises like deadlifts and squats and so on um well that's that's to work those very muscles that hold us upright as bipeds yeah, so obviously the hamstrings are part of that posterior chain. So they are, yeah, exactly, yeah. And and so you know what you can see if you imagine it. I mean, I've got a diagram in in my my master's thesis, which is kind of showing how um, if you were to pick up a heavy load with a crane, you know, a crane that's kind of bent over um, so that it's uh, it's picking, say, a container off of a ship or something like that, we'll have a cable system kind of running down the back of it so that the cable pulls that load. Uh, up off the ship um, and so the, the load being picked up off the ship is a bit like the, the head and the crane arm is a bit like the back and the crane uh, I don't know what you call it but the stem going up to, to, to the driver's control would be like the legs and so you need to really tension up that posterior cable system to be able to lift anything um, and so you know what we've had to do as bipeds is to really recruit that whole posterior chain just to be able to stand up so we're already using that system in a way that is quite novel um and you know it may be a price that we pay uh, is to have this high rate of, of hamstring strain it's a bit like the way people talk about back pain as the, you know one of the prices that we pay for being bipedal um and i think there's some truth to that but i think also we are incredibly evolved you know when, when you know you understand some of these stabilization mechanisms that you and i have studied over the years they're just mind-blowingly uh clever you know solutions to this kind of a challenge so it is quite incredible how 
we do stand up and move around with actually very good function if if we are well balanced and i think that's one of the key things Definitely. Mm. so f- from your research are there particular sports that tend to see more hamstring injuries and perhaps some sports that tend to have less yeah i mean ba- basically sprinting sports uh tend to be the the, the, the primary uh sport where you'll get hamstring strains and that's again because of this these very high loads put through the legs as you're sprinting but it also, the, what you find in the, the literature around it is they'll, they'll talk about cutting and planting sports, which isn't gardening, by the way. It's, uh, it's, it's where you cut to, to change position, to change direction, um, but planting your foot as well. So it seems to be this change of direction element that, that's really quite important as well. And so that kind of points back to this function of the hamstrings in, you know, stabilization, of course, of, of the uh the, the, the whole body, particularly the pelvis, but also that the, that rotation through the knees that we were talking about, you know. So um, I think I think that you know data kind of really reflects that. Yeah, yeah. Just thinking yeah. of my own kind of experience watching sport, and I can mm. think you know football, or soccer, sprinting, yeah. and track and field. They're they're the ones that spring to mind as being you know you'll see someone sprinting mm-hmm. along and all of a sudden you see them start hopping on one leg and they're holding their hamstring yeah yeah but I, I i kind of think i don't i haven't seen that much in other sports and obviously someone that's very um you know a big fan of tennis i've never really mm. seen many tennis players pull up with a hamstring injury i don't really hear about many tennis players having ham- hamstring injuries which is interesting considering the amount of changes in direction yeah. that there are yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe it's, it's yeah. to do with the fact that and I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. Is it because it's more likely to happen if you're running full speed forwards and then you change direction? Yeah, well, I think I think there's a couple of things there. One is def- definitely what you said that that, that uh, it's where you really get into your full flow, that full stride. It doesn't tend to be, you know, as you accelerate, it tends to be when you're kind of at, at full pace. And you know, if you've seen footage of someone like Michael Owen or, or sprinters, it tends to be somewhere around the 50, 60 meter mark that suddenly their hamstring will go. Um, so yeah, that, and that's to do with obviously when you get to full pace, you're really opening your legs out, you know, um, and uh, and the loads that are going through the tissues are, are crazy. Um, I never managed to find the actual loads for the hamstrings, but I, I found uh, a piece of research by a guy called Professor Lees at Liverpool John Moores University, and he he showed that the gastrocnemius takes 22 times body weight when you're sprinting, and the quads take 33 times body weight, or they transfer 33 times body weight, which is just crazy, crazy loads. So the hamstrings would be somewhere in that in that ballpark, obviously, um, particularly as they are they're driving you forwards as well. Unless you're on, um, unless you're on a treadmill. Yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's also the fact that w- when you're at that full stride, you, you're not only uh, flexing the hip maximally, which which stretches the hamstring at the upper end, but you're also extending the knee, and therefore you're stretching the hamstring at the lower end. So you're getting a kind of full stretch mm. under load you know, at either end of the hamstring. So I think that's part of it. So that, that's the first thing that I would say. But the, the other thing that, that ties in with what we were saying about rotational control of the knee and so on is that, of course, these things often are cumulative uh, microtrauma. So you, if you if you stress that hamstring cumulatively through lots of rotations um, and, you, you know, w- whatever mechanisms, you know, it could be running, it could be, you know, like I described earlier, bending forwards to pick something up. Um, well, across time, that cumulative stress can decrease the tensile strength in the tissues. We, we know that cumulative stress does that. And then, you know, you put it under a high load like sprinting and, and that could be enough to then rupture it, which is what we often see. So I think I think it's possibly a combination of those factors. Yeah, it's interesting, again, just with my tennis hat on, is that, I mean, when you look at the, the elite level sport, I would imagine tennis mm. players probably get a lot more microtrauma than football players just for the amount of time that they spend playing. You know, they're practicing sure. hours every day. They're competing, you know, several hours a day. I think they are on a three-set average match. I think they're talking about a thousand changes of direction per match. Um, mm. So it's quite interesting that in terms of community trauma, I would say that doesn't necessarily fit if you're comparing tennis to football. Mm -hmm. But it might be that because you're never really even getting to, you know, I mean, you might accelerate, but you're accelerating for such a short period of time, you're getting nowhere near your top end speed. Yeah. 
So you're not getting that yeah, range of motion yeah. through the hamstring. Yeah, it could be that. I mean, obviously in football, you've got kicking, which which is, um, you know, you could say it's a kind of non-physiological thing to do. Of course, everyone can kick and animals kick and so on. But to kick as much and as regularly and with as much uh, power as, say, a professional footballer or even even a, you know, kind of um, weekend warrior type footballer, um, it's, it's a huge amount of, of um, again, repetitions. But the interesting thing about kicking is is that, you know, you're having to decelerate the foot um, using the hamstrings to control the power with which the quadriceps are extending the knee. And, and this is a concept that I talk a bit about in, in my thesis and in various papers and presentations is, is that, you know, the, the, the quads, if you, if you see the quads like the engine that, that, that drives the, the foot forwards when you kick, well, the hamstrings are like the brakes. And so if your engine is more powerful than your brakes, then you're going to have a crash, right? Um, so you need brakes that, that will match the performance of, of, of the quads. And so, I mean, one of the things that was going on even back in the 90s when I was doing my research was footballers were being encouraged to do a lot of quad work, like knee extensions on, on the weights machines to improve the power of their kick. Um, but they weren't necessarily being encouraged to do hamstring work. And if they were, it was normally on a kind of hamstring curl machine which doesn't really reflect how you use the the, the uh, leg in kicking in any instance. Um, so um, so yeah, you know I think that that's a factor that um, we could bring into the high instance in footballers. Um, also, you know you've got the quality of the pitch, you've got being jostled by other players, you've got quite a few factors that are a little bit different with football. And you know one of the things about tennis and, and most individual sports is that players for a long time now have typically been quite particular about their own nutrition and hydration and so on which hasn't been the trend in football until really the last 10 15 years um so so you know footballers were kind of renowned for for not looking after their bodies um and and not looking for the edge from a nutritional perspective because you know i think there's this kind of element of bravado. It's all about the skill level, you know, what, what can you do with the football? Um, you know, you ha- and you had role models in the past, like George Best, who was an alcoholic, but the best footballer in the world at the time, yeah. or one of them. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think uh, there's that element to it as well that plays in a little bit. Yeah. You, you mentioned yeah. your master's thesis again, which, you know, you know, it was on hamstring strains. Can you go into a little mm. more detail about, you know, what it was about, what you looked at and what the findings were? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, basically, I, I assessed um, professional footballers, and I managed to get twenty of them to, to come in for the assessment. Um, and what I was interested in, you know, again inspired by this Michael Owen situation, was were there lumbar pelvic re- reasons, let's say, you know, so so issues with the the low back and the pelvis that could be driving this recurrent hamstring situation. And that's a fairly kind of osteopathic way to, to look at it. Generally, when there's an injury in osteopathy, what you do is you look above and below the injury. Of course, you, you still treat the injury and work on the symptomatic tissues, but you tend to think, well, what, what is it that stress those tissues? And so you'd look at the knee to see if that's functioning well. I mean, one of the things I didn't mention about the, um, the hamstrings earlier is that the, the uh, biceps morris attaches into the fibular head. And so if there's a, a lack of motion at the fibular head, that also can potentially affect hamstring function and, and maybe even induce a hamstring strain. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, is that the, the key thing that drives issues at the fibula head, so the fibula is the other mm. bone in the lower leg alongside the, uh, the tibia. Um, so, yeah, the most common reason that the fibula head doesn't move so well or sometimes moves too much is because of an ankle sprain, because of an injury at the other end of the bone, if you like. Um, and so, you know, this is an example of how, how uh, kind of osteopathic thinking w- would take it. As you'd look at the ankle, has that got a good range of motion? You look at the fibula head, does that work well? Anything going on at the knee? And then you look above and you look at the hip, you look at the sacroiliac joints, and you look at the nerve supply to the hamstrings, which is from the lumbar spine and, and that sacroiliac region. Um, so that was kind of what informed my thinking for the research for the master's. And so I was thinking, well, you know, how can I assess this? And um, what I decided to do was to do essentially a fairly standard manual assessment on these guys, um, as well as using a piece of kit that the college that I was uh, working at at the time, they had this thing called a Cybex dynamometer. Um, 
And that wasn't that unusual because a lot of football clubs or, or performance centres would have a Cybex dynamometer. But this was the only one in mainland UK that actually had a trunk extension flexion uh, component to it. So you could actually measure the function of the, the back muscles and the abdominal muscles. And there's various research done into that that would show that, you know, if, if, if you got a certain amount of torque or power at a certain point in the movement pattern, that was good. And if it was late, then that suggested that you had an injury there or some kind of protective behavior and so on. So, so we assessed these players and the way I set it up was I asked the physios at various London teams, professional teams to send in players that had recurrent hamstring strain. And I said, could they send at least one control player? Um, so, you know, to act or a player that didn't have a hamstring strain, let's say, to act as a control. Um, so I wasn't sure who was who. So that blinds the research. That means that I don't know who, who's who. I'm just assessing their low backs. Um, and then I'm assessing, uh, so I'm using the side backs for, for, for one of the assessments. Now I'm using my hands like I would do as an osteopath or a physio or a chiropractor would use or check, check practitioner would use um, to assess that lumbar pelvic region. Um, and it, it, you know, in a nutshell, what I found was that actually the, the manual assessment that I was doing was perhaps slightly more accurate, slightly more predictive of hamstring strain than the Cybex machine was. Um, the Cybex machine was able to highlight the players that have been out of play for longer, uh, which isn't too surprising because it was you know measuring strength. And so essentially there's a kind of deconditioning element that occurs if you've been out of play for a while. But but the kind of fascinating thing was is that even though I found that the... So, so yeah, I should just say after I'd done all the research... And I had all my results. At that point, I asked the physios to reveal who had the hamstring strain, who didn't. And it turned out that of the um, 20 players that came in, one of them decided he didn't want to get involved uh, because he didn't realize that there was this maximal kind of uh, engagement with this Cybex machine. He was worried he was going to hurt his back. So he said, I- I'm out. So I had 19. And of those 19, it turned out that five of them were controls. Um, and the hamstring group had slightly... Um, more findings of, of lumbar pelvic dysfunction on my manual assessments than the control group. So you look at it, you go, okay, well, it's slightly more, but it wasn't statistically significantly more. Okay. So that's, so, so that was a little bit frustrating, but then I also fortunately asked the physios to tell me about the medical history of the control group. And it turned out that of course they had sent me people with low back pain because they knew I was using this low back pain dynamometer and they wanted to find out if it could tell them anything. So actually the hamstring group had more lumbar pelvic dysfunction than the control group, but the control group, 80% of them had low back pain. (laughs) So, so actually, you know, you could, you could look at that and go, well, that just shows that there is lumbar pelvic dysfunction in players with hamstring injury. Of course, the question is, you know, is that, is that uh, the results of the injuries, you know, is, is it, uh, something that has happened secondary to a hamstring injury, or is it the cause of the hamstring injury? And that's that's more difficult for us to delineate. But the strong likelihood is that it actually drove the hamstring injury for 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 a number of reasons. Um, so so that was basically the the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but yeah, quite fascinating. Uh, and and again, you know, a way of thinking that was a bit beyond what it seemed the guys at Liverpool were doing with Michael Owen, where, where they really were focusing in on the hamstring. And weren't so much looking outside of that for the uh, for, for the mechanism of injury, the cause of injury. As a semi-professional rugby player, Billy had suffered from recurring injuries for the previous three years before coming to see me. He'd been suffering from a sharp pain, swelling, and tightness in the top of his right leg. It was especially bad when drop kicking and punting. He tried sports massage and stretching. We had brought about some short-term relief, however. When playing rugby, the pain always returned. He also suffered from sharp pain in both groins, which restricted his movements. The pain was worsened by kicking and changing direction at speed. And as a fly half, kicking and changing direction was an essential part of Billy's game. Acupuncture and sports massage had some benefit, but still felt tight afterwards. All the above injuries meant that he could only play three matches in a row before he had to take three to four weeks out to recover. This was very frustrating for Billy. Billy came to see me to help condition him during the off-season so he would be ready for the upcoming season, even though he wasn't very confident that anyone could help him get rid of these injuries. I had a very limited time to help Billy, but over the eight-week off-season, after thorough assessments, 
I gave Billy a corrective exercise program for the first four weeks and a strength and power program for the second four weeks prior to his preseason training. Over halfway through the season, Billy reported that he is yet to get injured. In fact, he was kicking better and further than ever. He was running quicker, cutting off one foot better and bursting through tackles and that he'd never felt so sharp, quick and strong. If you're in pain and it's preventing you from doing what you love to do and you'd like to achieve great results like Billy, just go to www.bodycheck.co.uk. That's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K.co.uk to request your consultation. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah. Looking at looking at the research into hamstring strains over the years, what, what would you say are perhaps some of the weaknesses of the research? Well, I mean, most of it, like, it's, it's an interesting kind of field research because, you know, of course, the, what you have to do to, to get an effective study um, is to really isolate something down and and look at that individual thing. Um, but the problem is, is that, of course, nothing works in isolation. And so it's not very real world. So you always have this kind of almost there's opposing uh, goals, you know, um, for, I, and, and this is where I've always said that that that's great that people want to do that kind of reductionist research because we need that, that that's helpful. But it's important not to believe that research in isolation on its own. What's important is to take that research and combine it with other pieces of research, to combine it with clinical practice, to combine it with you know anatomy and biomechanics and kinematics and all of the things that we would do in our check assessments so that we then have a much more functional, holistic understanding of why that hamstring strain may have come about in the first place or, or whatever injury, you know, could, could be any part of the body. Um, but so... You know, essentially, most of the research was saying that the, the the leading cause of hamstring strain is hamstring strain, and and that's still true. That's still true. If you look at it, I, in fact, I looked at the three most recent papers that came up on PubMed um, this morning, just so I thought oh, I better check to see where what the status is of current research before I do this podcast. And it's still the same. It's still the same. It's still the most prevalent injury across all sports. Um, and uh, yeah, the most common cause of hamstring strain is previous hamstring strain. So, so the interesting thing about that is you think, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. You injure something, perhaps it's a bit weaker, et cetera. But, but you know, muscles are extremely highly perfused with blood vessels. And so they should heal extremely well, very quickly, minimal scar tissue, which is another thing that's cited as a, as a cause of recurrent strain. And of course, that's not to say it's not a cause, but if it was the only cause, you'd expect any muscle that gets injured to keep getting re-injured. And, and that doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, of course, there's a trend towards that. But, you know, it's quite rare for people to get recurrent quad strains or recurrent calf strains. And it, do, it does happen, obviously, but it's not nearly as common as a recurrent hamstring strain. So there's something, seems to be something additional about the hamstrings that's driving this recurrent nature of it. Um, and so to me, that's that's looking outside of it and looking at the, its function in that biomechanical chain. When, when you were saying that, well, you know, first of all, how ridiculous <laughs> that is, right? It's a bit like saying yeah, yeah. the cause of death is dying. Yes, and, it is. And, and it, it is. happens often when it's happened before, right? Well, if you believe in reincarnation, yeah. we've all died many times before. We're going to die again. <laughs> That's you know, it. So, that's it. You know, what, yeah. if our medical industry said, "Well, the reason that people die is because of death," right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that would yeah. be even worse than what they're current. They're already doing. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, of, often the research would also talk about things like you know uh, the strength of the hamstrings being an issue, um, and in fact, I, even that wasn't well documented when I was doing the research in the nineties. Uh, you know, it was, it was some of the papers were saying, oh, maybe it's a strength thing, but it wasn't hadn't been really been studied. Um, a lot of them are saying that the hamstrings need stretching, um, which is, you know, kind of controversial um, in, in some ways. Not again, not that stretching hamstrings is controversial. It's just whether or not the person needs it is controversial uh, and uh, whether or not that hamstring tension is there for another reason, which is something else, you know, we might talk about. But, but there's lots of reasons the hamstrings will tighten up, um, which are kind of functional, but they're compensations you know um and so this is stuff that really wasn't being talked about and still from, from my research this morning it's still they really aren't being talked about um 
So it's quite interesting that it takes a while for these ideas to kind of filter in. And um, yeah, we're still, I think, a little bit in the dark um, as to how to manage it or yeah, prevent it's it. Interesting. And, you know, I was a member of the uh, UK Strength and Conditioning Association for, for quite a few years. I think I only yeah, did yeah. a membership maybe a year or two ago. Yeah. And pretty much the only thing that really I tended to get from any any research or any articles was, oh, hamstrings, you just got to do eccentric strengthening. That was... Yeah, that was, that was something... It. That was the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that was, uh, if I recall, that kind of came in the late noughties, you know, like 2008, 2010, maybe that kind of era where someone had done a research study on Nordic curls, which is this thing where you're kneeling up, kneeling up high, and you, you, you kind of wedge your feet under something solid. Um, and, and then you essentially, or you've got, you know, your partner's holding your feet down. And the idea is you, you lower yourself down towards the ground um, almost like to a press up position, really. Um, but you're using your hamstrings to control that eccentrically. And, you know, there's all kind of excitement about it and how this seemed to, to really help um, and to be preventative and so on. And, and again, I think there's some merit to it, but it's still really ignoring how the hamstrings are used in functional daily movement, you know, and in, in sporting movements. Um, so it's still quite an isolated view. It's like, can we strengthen this muscle in an eccentric way? In a sort of, fairly non-functional um movement pattern you know um so uh, but it, it, you know it seems to help it's, it's like a lot of things you know you, you can strengthen a muscle um you know you could let's say you could strengthen your low back muscles just by doing a bunch of deadlifts or something and, and that may well help your back pain but it's not going to switch on your multifidus or it's not going to help you to, to to move better uh in a more functional or efficient way necessarily you know um uh, to do that you really need to break those movement patterns down and build them back up into an integrated mm. whole and um that's something that uh, of course you know paul check was the first person to really talk about that uh, and to do it in a really effective way uh, and that was largely what attracted me into his training as it was a key part of what attracted me into the check Institute training was that that you know he, he had this stuff down you know and and in a very holistic way which makes perfect sense to to my way of thinking and to the physiology and and, and the applied biomechanics and so on so um so yeah that's that's what i would say about the uh, yeah, eccentric I mean, girls. you know in most instances it's always going to be of benefit to strengthen a muscle right if it's if you're putting it under yeah. a lot of load there's going to be a benefit to making it a strong muscle yeah so yeah. but that's all well and good but if as you said the hamstring is straining because it's compensating for something else that's probably weak right or something else mm -hmm. that needs stabilizing yeah all mm -hmm. well and good strengthening that muscle but if you don't strengthen or balance what's around it you're going to be constantly still putting excessive load through that muscle as well yeah and i think you know this is this is a big sort of flaw with the way we've been thinking about muscles for a long time because muscles really you know they're not they're not just pieces of plasticine that you can either stretch or you can bunch up or whatever that they have a nervous system attached to them and that nervous system is bi-directional so so it's it's both you know your your motor uh control centers in the brain um that tell you how to move they're sending information to the muscle about how to contract and when to contract and which portions of the muscle to contract and so on um but you've also got information coming back from the muscle to the brain to tell the brain what length the hamstring's in, what loads are coming up through the foot, what direction the body is about to turn and so on. And all of that information is being integrated and synthesized to put out effective muscle contractions that allow you to run forwards or in a in sort of multiple planes of, uh, of movement or change direction or turn or kick a football or jump to get a header and land slightly awkwardly. All of these things, the brain's monitoring all of that and putting out just an amazing sort of array of, of neural impulses to allow you to play a game of football or play a game of basketball or whatever it might be. Um, so, um, so this idea that just doing some Nordic curls is the solution to hamstring strain is, is very basic. Yeah. It say. might be one piece of a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle perhaps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we spoke a little bit about perhaps the, let's say the weaknesses of the research on hamstrings. What have you noticed mm. about over the years how 
the kind of general, let's call it medical community, have looked to treat uh, injury of the hamstrings? Yeah, well, I mean, from what I've seen, and I've seen, you know, I've seen some of it at quite a high end and some of it you know, just through talking with people and being at conferences and, and uh, you know, reading the literature that's coming out and so on. Um, it still is quite focused towards the hamstrings um, in terms of, you know, actually on that tissue. So various things like, you know, your ultrasound was what was one thing that people were, were using a lot at one point. And then, you know, shockwave therapy and foam rolling and all kinds of different techniques for working directly on the hamstring itself, you know, manual techniques um, and still not so much focused away from the hamstring, such as, you know, how are those sacroiliac joints functioning? You know, is there an imbalance side to side? Is one moving too much, one moving too little? Um, how is the core working? You know, is, is the transverse abdominis doing what it's supposed to do or is the hamstring having to compensate for that? Is the multifidus doing what it's supposed to do? These are stabilizer muscles, of course, of, of the pelvis. Um, uh, or is the hamstring compensating for them? And there was a, there was a interesting study in 2003 by Barbara Hungerford where she showed that when there's low back pain, she was actually looking at sacroiliac joint pain. Now, just to preface this before I go into it, what she found, um, one of the things that was found in the 90s is that when people have pain, the multifidus gets inhibited. So this low back stabilizer muscle gets inhibited, switched off by the pain, as does the transverse abdominis, which is this corset muscle around the uh, abdomen and um so we kind of knew of that already um but what barbara hungerford found is that when there's sacred act joint pain um actually I've, I've, I've jumped the gun again too quickly part of what we know also about the multifidus and, and the transverse abdominis is that they fire ahead of movement so they have what's called a feed forward mechanism so before you move your arm before you move your leg uh these muscles engage to create stability so this is the idea that, uh, as Paul Check says, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. So in order to be able to generate power, you've got to stabilize first, then you can generate power. So this feed forward mechanism means that the transverse abdominis and multiples fire about 30 milliseconds ahead of arm movement, and about 90 milliseconds ahead of leg movement. So essentially, um, that, that was what was known in the 90s. Um, but the outer muscles, things like the deltoid and the hamstrings and the glutes, um, they tend to fire, you know, as you move, right? So what Barbara Hungerford found was that when there's sacral leg joint pain, the biceps femoris, this hamstring uh, muscle that is very commonly injured, it actually fires ahead of the multifidus and transverse abdominis, partly because they're inhibited, but partly because the, the drives to that biceps femoris have been upregulated because essentially it's now trying to stabilize the sacral leg joints and perform a role that is it is able to stabilize but it's just one of many stabilizers and and so you know whereas before it might have been taking 10 percent of the role of stabilizing if there's pain there suddenly the transversus and the multifidus which which take a lot more of the the, the role of stabilizing perhaps you know 30 percent each well now they're not working until late and so the biceps femoris is firing and, and essentially making up that 60 percent deficit so it's increasing its tone um, and so that could like, be a mechanism for hamstring, right? That's like, you know, driving your car, you've got the accelerator on and the brake at the same time. It is, exactly, because, you know, the hamstring is a mobilizer muscle. It's, it's designed to move you forwards primarily. That's that's its primary function. Um, it's biarticular, which, again, tells you that its, it's uh, role is primarily to move. Um, and yet it's being asked to stabilize. And so, like you say, it's, it's, it's having to sort of hold tension, but at the same time move. Um, and, and that is essentially two, two different roles, which means that it's going to like, well, the analogy you just gave is perfect. I'm trying to drive forwards, but with the brakes on. Um, so yeah, no wonder it gets yeah. worn down right, and stressed. So yeah. I want to move on and go a little bit more detail in terms of what, so what can really cause hamstring strain so <laughs> well, well, how long have you got <laughs> i was, I was getting a bit worried when i was seeing how many questions i was thinking of earlier um but we'll get we'll go yeah. as deep as we can or we run out of time i think that's uh probably the best way to go okay so the first thing i'd really like you to, to discuss is gravity patterns and their association with hamstring strains because i think i think i'm right in saying that's probably the most common kind of aspect 
I think so. I mean, I think, you know, if it, it, it ties in with all the information that we've got. And, uh, of course, the gravity pattern in, in the way we, we would describe it is uh, also known as a pronation pattern or an overpronation pattern. And um, so some, a lot of people have heard of pronation in the foot. Um, and uh, that means essentially that your foot's going flat, too flat, um, when you're walking or running or jumping or even just standing. Um, and that's an indication that essentially the muscles that prevent pronation, which are the supinator muscles, they are not doing their job properly. Okay. Um, and so a gravity pattern is, is where either statically, but more commonly dynamically, the person is unable to resist gravity. And so they're going into an over pronation. Um, so that tends to mean that the foot will collapse, but also what happens as part of that pattern is the knee tends to roll inwards. And as the knee rolls inwards, it puts stress onto the medial collateral ligament of the knee, onto the medial meniscus of the knee, and onto the anterior cruciate ligament of the knee. Um, and uh, and so then, you know, if you look at, well, what is it that stops that knee from rolling inwards? There's a bunch of different muscles that are involved, but locally to the knee, it's, it's the biceps femoris. So the biceps femoris is the reins. So remember, we've got the reins on the horse, and you've got the medial hamstring group on the inside of the, the, the knee, and you've got the biceps femoris on the outside of the knee, and to stop that knee from rolling inwards, it's the biceps femoris that has to pull. So, so, and you know, the other key element of this is that if you were to load that leg and it rolls in, because gravity is trying to pronate you, and you're using your muscular system to prevent that overpronation, but it means that that biceps femoris is being engaged eccentrically. And one of the things we haven't mentioned too much yet is is that is the eccentric phase of contraction, which is where muscle strain tends to occur. It doesn't really happen in the concentric phase. So it's, it's in that eccentric or lengthening phase of, of loading the muscle. So that's essentially what, what is um, a very strong uh, contender for, for, the, for the primary cause of, of hamstring strain is this inability to effectively resist gravity. But that obviously is complex and there's, there's lots of elements to that um, from core function, which is one of the key things, um, uh, in particular, pelvic control so so uh, avoiding an anterior pelvic tilt under load because as the pelvis tilts anteriorly which is like it kind of uh, if you imagine the pelvis like a bowl of soup tilting it forwards would be the soup would come out the front um so that's an anterior tilt that couples with this this gravity pattern or pronation pattern also known as medial rotational instability um so the core is very key in that in, in preventing anterior tilt but so are the glutes which we mentioned earlier, they're often somewhat deconditioned or relatively deconditioned compared to the quads. And the quads pull the pelvis into this, this uh, gravity pattern, unfortunately. So, so, uh, so th- there's a bit of an issue there. Um, and, you know, say the glutes kind of colloquially, but you, of course they break down into glute maximus, which is heavily involved in preventing this overpronation pattern. Uh, and one of the things we should probably mention there for, for the anatomy buffs is that, you know, the glute maximus um, is obviously mainly considered a, a hip extensor and, and a lateral rotator of, of the hip, um, but it inserts into the iliotibial band. And for, for many, many years, in fact, still in, in most anatomy classes, you'll just learn that, uh, yeah, it pulls a bit on the, the iliotibial band, but it doesn't have a particularly strong action. And that's because most anatomy has been done historically on a cadaver that's laying in a neutral position, let's say, you know, just, just laying supine on, on, on a table. But if you put that cadaver or indeed a live human being into a gait type pose or a lunging type pose or a squatting type pose, essentially with hip flexion, and knee flexion, then what you see is that the fibers of glute maximus, they actually run directly into that iliotibial band. And the iliotibial band, which is this band of tissue that runs down the outside of the thigh, it's the bit that's often extremely sore to, to foam roll if, if, if you do that kind of thing. Um, it goes all the way down to the tibia again, and it prevents, it kind of facilitates what the, the uh, biceps femoris does, which is to prevent this medial rotation or inward rotation, this gravity pattern at the knee. So you can see, well, hang on, if my glutes are deconditioned, well, what's that going to put stress onto? It's going gonna, it's gonna to put stress onto the biceps femoris again. So now poor, poor old biceps femoris is doing the role of, uh, you know, multiple muscles potentially, and it ends up getting strained. Yeah, and that, so, and that I guess... Is probably a major explanation as to why the biceps femoris tends to strain more than the semitendinosus or the semimembranosus. Yeah, I think so. I think I think that's it. And and you know another another element to that is that 
you know, you've got two big medial hamstrings pulling against one small lateral hamstring, or not small, but 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 relatively smaller. Um, and then there are several other medial rotation rotators in the knee as well, such as popliteus is, is one, um, uh, gracilis is another one. Um, and so, and then you've got gravity trying to medially rotate the knee. So the poor old biceps femoris is, is doing a heck of a lot. Um, so, uh, again, it's not too surprising that it's the most injured, uh, uh yeah. hamstring. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, we, we, we talked about pronation in terms of this gravity pattern from the top down, but, but perhaps one thing we should mention is pronation from the bottom up, um, just briefly, because, you know, in the world of podiatry, uh, the idea that pronation occurs from the at the foot and then it drives medial rotation at the knee is is another way of looking at the body and that's kind of more akin to thinking of the body like a skyscraper and the feet like the foundations and uh, if that foot's rolling in then of course it affects the structure higher up um, which which has some merit um, but probably not as much merit as is given to it by you know, your sports shoe manufacturers and some podiatrists uh, and orthotics prescribers and so on. Because really, you know, the foot is kind of the tail of the dog, you know, and, and the dog is really higher up the leg, you know. So so it's it's like if you focus on the foot, it's like the tail wagging the dog rather than the dog wagging the tail. So again, you know, an evolutionary view on that is that it doesn't matter what animal you look at from Tyrannosaurus right up to you know deer or wolves or dogs or humans, the bulk of the muscle is always around the hip. Okay, and then into the thigh, and there's less muscle in the calf, and there's almost no muscle in the foot because the foot is the slave to the hip and to the core. So, you know, in terms of functionality, pronation patterns tend to be descending pronation patterns from the core downwards with way more regularity than they are from the from the base up. But there are times, there will be times where foot's got weak for some reason or it's been deconditioned, often because it's been oversupported. Um, and therefore, the foot itself is driving a pronation issue. Um, but that's that's is, is way more common than it's the other way around. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's just another factor to throw in on that that sort of pronation or gravity pattern discussion. So, the next thing I want you to discuss is something that you came up with. I know twenty years ago, right? It was the uh, cumulative trauma model. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you want to? explain what that is and how that could possibly relate to hamstring strains yeah so i mean what i was trying to demonstrate with the, this cumulative trauma model was was the notion that you've got if you, if you think of a graph and you've got your y-axis on one side and your x-axis going along the bottom and um if that x-axis going along the bottom is essentially your lifespan or your genetic potential you could say um, then what happens when you're born is you've got no cumulative trauma yet, right? You know, you've just been born from the womb into a field of gravity and suddenly now you're exposed to the stress of gravity, which actually is quite extraordinarily high. You know, this is why cosmonauts and astronauts can't even walk from the spacecraft when they come back to Earth because they, they, they've got so deconditioned to being in a field of gravity. Okay, so so these are huge loads that the body is tolerating. We just don't really feel it because we're well conditioned for it. We've evolved to handle it. Um, but so... The cumulative trauma model is the notion that uh, across time, you're going to accumulate micro trauma to the body. And uh, of course, the other side to that is that you're going to heal from that cumulative micro trauma. And so that's what we do when we go to the gym. You know, we, we, we work out with weights to create micro trauma in the muscle. The muscle heals, it heals stronger and we become more conditioned. And that's fantastic because our healing rate is above the rate of the trauma rate now if we train too hard or we take a load that's way too heavy for us then we can exceed the rate at which we can heal it uh, so in other words we, we can actually um rupture a tissue or damage a tissue or and it can even apply to you know organs or to joints or whatever that if you if you um exceed the stress that the tissue can heal from then you're going to get collapse of that tissue, whether it be a ligament or an organ or, or, or a muscle. So what the what the um, diagram tries to illustrate is that you've got the cumulative trauma going up from the bottom of the y-axis, going kind of diagonally up, uh, accumulating across time. And then at the top of the y-axis, you've got your healing rate. And that slowly tails off across time. And we know that our healing rate tails off across time because 
our level of growth hormone decreases uh, year on year as, as we come out of childhood. Um, and from our 20s onwards, uh, if I remember the figure, I think we lose, it's either 9% or 14% growth hormone per, per decade, something like that. I think it's 14% is what rings a bell. Um, and so the point being that, you know, decade by decade, we, we, we can't heal nearly as well. And of course, that healing rate is not just influenced by things like growth hormone, um, but it's influenced by things like nutrition, by sleep, by hydration, by stress levels, all kinds of different elements, which, you know, anyone who's studied hormones knows that those are the things that will impact on growth hormone and, you know, and so on. So, so the, the, the point really is that we can improve or minimize the amount of cumulative microtrauma by optimizing our biomechanics and our, and our, let's say our motor control. So the way we use our body um, to keep that cumulative microtrauma minimal. So it's not too steep a curve or, or, or a line. And then we can also optimize our healing rate by eating well, sleeping well, drinking well, breathing well, thinking well, and whatever the last one is um, <laughs> moving well. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, that, that, um, that is really kind of summarizing what we do as, as check trained professionals, you know, we, we, we work to balance the body as best we can to improve its function and the way it moves. Um, and then also to optimize its healing rate. And, and the, the goal of course, is that those two lines never cross. If the, if the trauma rate exceeds the healing rate, boom, that's where the tissue or the organ fails. And if that happens before you've reached your genetic potential, well then you haven't realized your potential as a human being. Oh. If it, if it, happens right at the end of your life where well, that's where it's supposed to happen right <laughs> that's, then you've reached your potential and so that's really you know been a kind of driving goal of my clinical work for for at least a couple of decades is to, to help people to realize their potential that's what i saw the check system really offers is is that uh, opportunity mm. amir was a 42 year old professional man suffering from acne he was overweight suffering from low confidence and he had very low energy levels when he first came to see me. He was also spending £400 per month on products to cover up his acne. His skin was very oily, his face and scalp were covered in acne, and he worried that it might start to affect his work. Amir was a sugar lover, and it took him some time to wean himself off of sugar, but slowly over time, Amir made the necessary changes. Upon testing his gut microbiome, it was discovered that he did have a minor imbalance of gut microbes, including Staphylococcus aureus, which is often linked to skin conditions. He had hormonal imbalances, which would have affected his energy levels and a number of food sensitivities that may have been causing his acne. Amir was also given supplementation to help rebalance his gut microbiome and his hormones. And within a few weeks, his skin improved to the point where he had clear skin for the first time in 30 years. If you would like to achieve the same kind of result as Amir, you can now follow a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide in my brand new book, Eliminating Adult Acne for Good, available now from all major online bookstores and via my website at www.bodycheck.co.uk forward slash books. And it's and it's really sad when you, you know, you, you listen back to the story of Michael Owen, mm. and you think, you know, he was nineteen when he had yeah. a complete rupture of his hamstring, and he, yeah, you know, I mean, it was two years later that he won the Ballon d'Or, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously, from from age nineteen to twenty six, when he then ruptured his cruciate uh, anterior cruciate ligament. Mm. which was the point where his career absolutely nosedived from that point on. Yeah. It was pretty much done by that point. Yeah. yeah. Do you think if he had, you know, had a check practitioner in his camp, mm. looking after his conditioning, you know, getting his biomechanics optimized, his nutrition, his lifestyle, because, you know, going back to the nineties, footballers weren't looking after themselves in terms of their nutrition. Yeah. Um, you know, they were probably eating tons of wheat yeah, well, I think they yeah. nothing football would still still do actually. Probably some of them do, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But you know, he probably would have been tons of wheat. May well have had, you know, issues with that, which we'll come on to in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's just really sad that, you know, what he. I mean, he was amazing. In, he still had an amazing career. 
You know, he still hadn't yes, had a career, yes. but what could he have achieved if, you know, he hadn't have had that point when he was 19 where that you know, rate of trauma exceeded his, his rate of healing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and, and that's, that's you know, I, I feel sad for him about that as well because, you know, he really could have been one of the greats of all time. Mm. He had so much potential, you know, and of course, you know, he realised some of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, just, I mean, we, we don't know the, the, the sort of inner story of it all, but but we can take a pretty good guess uh, at what did or didn't happen. Mm. And, um, yeah, you know, Clearly, it, it, it affected his performance uh, significantly. And, uh, you know, if you if you compare him to someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, who's, what, 38, 39 now, mm. and still firing on all cylinders and in immensely good shape, had a very, uh, you know, good career with, with minimal injuries, minimal time out, had a good strength conditioning coach at Manchester United, um, and, and also really a bit like Novak Djokovic, just follows the kinds of principles that are checked practitioner would would advise him you know yeah. he does everything he can to to, to optimize his game from getting to bed at 8 30 each night to wearing five fingers and using swiss balls and i mean he's like he's like he's kind of uh, consulted with a a check practitioner mm-hmm. somewhere along the line but 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 you know he's um he's basically just optimizing what he can get out of his body and, and sadly that's not what happened with with michael owen so uh yeah a bit of a contrast yeah definitely so mm. What I mentioned just now is the fact that, you know, footballers were probably chowing down a lot of wheat, normally in the yes. form of pasta, right? Yes, yes. So that, that brings me on to my next question. Is viscerosomatic reflex, can mm-hmm. you explain what that is and how that might potentially have a relationship with hamstring strains? Yeah, yeah. So viscerosomatic reflex just basically means viscera means the organs and soma means the body tissue. So they're really referring to, to the muscles um, primarily, but but also the joints and, and connective tissues. Um, and the idea that it's a reflex is is the notion that if you've got an issue with an organ um, and the one that everyone knows about is a heart attack, you know, so you've got an issue with your heart, then you get a reflexive pain in the shoulder and neck and and often down into the arm. Okay, so that's a viscerosomatic reflex that everyone knows about. But there's many different viscerosomatic reflexes um, that can occur. Um, and again, another one that probably everyone knows about but may, may not realise it's a viscerosomatic reflex is bloating. Um, and bloating is, you know, very common after you've eaten certain foods. Um, wheat is one of the ones that a lot of people react to, but some people react to rice and some people react to, to milk and, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different foods. Some some are more um, allergenic, essentially, uh, but also it seems to be uh, one of the things I think is useful for people to understand is that in the West, the most common food sensitivities are to, to wheat and to dairy. And in the East, the most common food sensitivities are to soya and to rice. So some of that is about the foods themselves being more allergenic and some it's just to do with the sheer amount that we eat and the amount of processing of those foods. Mm. And so um, what happens in those situations is that you get irritation uh, in the gut because essentially the immune system becomes sensitized. Um, and, And again, there's various sort of mechanisms and rationale for it, but the simple version is that the immune system becomes sensitized. The gut becomes inflamed the inflammation excites the nerves in there and sensory nerves. And those sensory nerves, even though sometimes you might feel some discomfort, you know, that does happen after eating, but often you just get bloating. Um, and that bloating is, is you know, again, a lot of people think it's gas. And normally there is a little bit of extra gas um, when you're bloated, but it doesn't account. There's been research into this on irritable bowel syndrome, and they've shown that uh, only 18% of that bloating is due to gas. So 82% is due to something else. And that's something else is a viscerosomatic reflex. It's the inhibition of the muscles that would normally hold that abdominal wall in. So what happens is they get switched off, the abdominal wall then pooches out because of the weight of the organs kind of falling forwards against it. Um, and so you walk around with a bloated tummy. Now, how that ties in with hamstring strain, there's there's a bunch of different ways, but, but perhaps the primary one is that the abdominal wall is uh, designed to stabilize the pelvis and to hold the pelvis in place, control the movement of the pelvis, and when it's inhibited like that, when it's shut down, um, then the hamstrings have to take up the role of stabilizing the pelvis. So, so that's that's an obvious kind of compensation that occurs. There's also research by a guy called Bu Hasira who um, looked into 
Um, <laughs> funnily enough, it was, a, it was an amusing study. I don't know who would have volunteered for this, but but he put um, a pressure cuff into the rectum of his subjects and pumped the pressure cuff up. Cuff up. I'm sure some people would be into that. Um, but but <laughs> but the point being that he was measuring EMG uh, of the hamstrings, and I don't exactly know why he was doing this, but but what he found was that hamstring EMG goes up as the pressure inside the colon or inside the, the rectum in this case increases. And he was, he was studying, I mean, he's, he's a, a gastroenterologist who's studying, you know, the effects of stimulation of what are called the baroreceptors in the digestive tract. So the baroreceptors, baro just, uh, it means pressure. So the pressure receptors, and that's how we need to go for number two is that the pressure starts to build up. The baroreceptors start to fire um, and same for, same for a we as well, for, for, for a number one, <laughs> is that um, you've got pressure receptors in the bladder as well, so baroreceptors. Um, and so when they fire, then, uh, then yeah, you get this sense of, sense of urgency and, and you go, you know, evacuate your, your bowel or bladder. Um, but so he was testing that. And what he found was that as the pressure went up on those receptors, so then the hamstrings start to fire. So what he is essentially showing is that people who are constipated – they're going to have increased activity of the hamstring and the hamstrings again reflects or sorry, sorry the colon reflects to the hamstrings um the uterus reflexes to the hamstrings the prostate reflexes to the hamstrings so issues in any of those organs the digestive system particularly the colon colon um so the large intestine but also any of those pelvic organs issues there will reflect to the hamstrings and so then you're going to get altered tone and sometimes pain in those areas as well, um, uh, which may masquerade as, a, as an injury. So it may not be that you've got a hamstring strain at all. It could be that you've got a uterine issue or that you've got a colon issue um, that needs addressing. Um, but even if you don't have anything too serious going on, let's say, you know, it's just it is a food sensitivity, something like that. That could be enough to essentially increase the tone of the hamstrings um, and, of course, switch off the, the other stabilizers. So now you're much more prone to a hamstring strain. Mm. And I know you've got experience of this, and you don't you don't need to mention names. But sure. Do you want Do you want to talk about the experience you had? I know it wasn't necessarily a hamstring strain, but the story. Was, well, it was. I think. Oh, was it? I yeah. Was, I was you talk, was, you're talking about the person at Chelsea. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, <clears throat> well, there's a there's a player at Chelsea who strained his hamstring. Uh, so, so Chelsea Football Club is is one of the Premiership teams here in the UK. It's one of the top flight teams for, for soccer or football and um basically this guy had injured his hamstring strain in the match on the saturday and they had the semi-final of the champions league coming up the next weekend and so they asked me to go in and look at him because they knew, knew that i'd specialized in hamstring strain uh, in professional footballers so um you know i went in and did an assessment and um there are a bunch of very interesting findings um one of the things was that he, it was left hamstring it's strain, left biceps femoris. And he had previously had um, surgery to his right shoulder. And, you know, one of the things that we know, and he had a very restricted range of motion in his right shoulder. So one of the things we know is that the opposite arm couples with the leg. Uh, so if you've got left hamstring, it would be the right shoulder that couples with that as you run. So if you've got restriction in that right shoulder, that's going to affect the mechanics of the left leg. Okay, so that's one thing. Then we assessed his lower abdominal wall strength and his coordination in the lower abdominal wall. And he had 60% lower abdominal strength and he, he couldn't coordinate the, the, the test. He couldn't pass the coordination test. Um, and bear in mind, this is a guy who's, you know, he's an international level footballer. Um, so you'd expect him to have 100% lower abdominal strength. You know, you, you expect him to have 120% <laughs> if that's if that's a possibility. Um, but, um, but again, the point is, is that his hamstring was strained quite possibly because his abdominal wall wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. Um, or it would have been a contributing factor, let's say. So I explained this to him and I said, um, you know, perhaps uh, you know, it could be something to do with your diet. And um, I think I'd done a, an HAQ, which is a health appraisal questionnaire, which uh, which screens the different organ systems. I did this with most of the players when I went in. Um, I can't fully remember now because it's about, I don't know, 16, 17, maybe 18 years ago. Um, and uh, anyway, one way or another, we, we got to the to, to the bottom of the fact that he had some kind of sensitivity to wheat because whenever he drank beer, he would sneeze. Whenever he ate bread, he would sneeze. So there seems to be some kind of 
yeasty, you know, gluten based uh, scenario going on for him where he would react and he would get bloated as well when he ate bread. So I just explained to him what we just talked about, really. And he was totally on board, said, yep, yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. You know, what should I do? Should I go on a gluten free diet? And I was saying, well, yeah, that's certainly, you know, something I would consider. And I, you know, I explained that I was already on a gluten free diet. When I mentioned this to the team doctor in my kind of report, I got a slap over the wrist and was told that you're not the team nutritionist. You shouldn't be advising players on uh, on their diet. Um, but also, no professional athlete can survive on a gluten-free diet because it's a miserable diet. And, you know, you should never be suggesting that to a professional athlete. So this was 2005, I think, somewhere around there. Um, so that was a bit of a knockback as it were um and i explained the physiology but you know and he also said that uh, this is the team doctor he also said that you know gluten intolerance i think was the term that he used at the time i think it's more commonly or more accurately called gluten sensitivity these days um he said that's you know it's, it's a real rarity you know less than one percent of the population have it and you know you wouldn't become a professional footballer if you if you had that um but what he was probably referring to was celiac disease mm. which is actually a true gluten allergy or a an allergy to, to the gliadin. Um, and so that wasn't what I was suggesting this player had. I was suggesting that he had a sensitivity, which is enough to create this bloating, this this inflammation in the gut, and then to increase the tone in the hamstring. Um, the issue was, of course, you know, this was something like the Wednesday. They wanted him back playing on the Saturday. So, I mean, you can certainly clean up someone's gut quite quickly and decrease inflammation quite quickly, but the likelihood of healing a strain that quickly was was very uh you know it, it was always going to be dubious as to whether or not that would happen um but yeah i mean what i found interesting was that i really got kind of shut down and um my understanding is that he didn't go on to follow a gluten-free diet because it wasn't recommended by the medical staff um and um about seven years later um i was in with wasps rugby team which is one of the top rugby teams here in the uk and um, we were actually showing them some of the five finger shoes, the, the, the barefoot shoes I was involved with at the time. And, um, you know, they, they did some interviews with us and uh, then said, do you want to go and get some lunch? And I said, oh, yeah, that's great. So we went to their canteen. They said, it's all paleo. It's all gluten free, no grains, um, you know, blah, 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 like this. And I was saying, oh, that's fantastic. And I was thinking, isn't that interesting that just in the space of seven years, you've got, gone from being told no professional athlete can survive on a gluten-free diet to 2012 one of the top rugby teams in the world actually all eating a gluten-free diet um and in the interim Djokovic had come out as gluten-free and there are a few other you know high profile athletes who had explained they're gluten-free because they want to get the best out of their bodies mm. but it's just just kind of interesting to see that evolution and mm. and and how you know new ideas get shut down even though they're based on sound physiology and sound clinical reasoning and and, and clinical experience but, um, you know, until it's published in the paper, a lot of people won't believe it. Mm. No? Yeah, I think that's a case of, you know, a doctor putting his own beliefs and values above above reality, really. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I mean, it's almost like, well, I wouldn't cut bread out of my diet, so that means no one else can. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's often the way, isn't it? Yeah. That's often, often where these things fall down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, ask you one more question because I know we could talk for hours on this subject yeah, yeah, yeah. i think this is a really important thing that you know people should be aware of and that's um the, the concept of the optic otic and occlusal plane reflexes and mm. how they can affect the functioning of the hamstrings yeah well so optic otic and occlusal plane reflexes are essentially the reflexes that keep your eyes ears and jaw on the horizon um, and so these are hardwired into all land animals. So it doesn't matter whether you're a lizard or a lion or a human being. We've all got these optic, otic and occlusal plane reflexes. And it allows you to focus and it allows you to balance and it allows you to bite with accuracy, um, you know, which is important for any animal, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a lion biting a jugular or whether it's a giraffe biting a leaf. You've got to do it accurately or, you, or you're not going to survive. Right. So. These are absolutely critical for survival, critical for, for perception of, of threat, uh, for identification of food, for identification of mates. So really, it all ties back in with those sort of reptilian reflexes. Um, but because it's so high priority, the nervous system puts it 
at the top of the tree um, to to sort of make sure that those things remain optimized no matter what. So if, for example, someone smacks you around the head and you end up with a tight muscle on one side of the head, you, you won't walk around with your eyes off like this. You actually shift your weight underneath you to get your, your head back onto the horizon so that your eyes, your ears, and your mouth are back on this optic-otic and occlusal plane reflex. And so, you know, what that means is that whenever there is some kind of disruption uh, to the function of, of really what we call the upper quarter, so, so the shoulders, the neck, the jaw, the head, um, then you'll often compromise things or even sacrifice things lower down in the body to retain that, that function. And this is, this is a concept that uh, really, you know, is physiological. You find it in any kind of good physiology book, uh, neuroanatomy book, neurophysiology book, but it's not really talked about in a clinically applied way uh, very much outside of what Paul Check has identified and perhaps the, the Nuka chiropractors talk about it a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's absolutely vital because this shift that you will do to, to, to get those eyes and ears and, and jaw back on the horizon, that will result in a weight shift through the lower limb. And so now you're loading one side more than the other. And it might just be a small amount, might be, you know, five pounds or, or a couple of kilograms. Um, but sometimes it's 20 pounds or, or even, you know, 40 pounds, 20 kilograms. Um, and so these are, you know, in and of themselves, they're not, they're not too big a stress on the body because, you know, your body handles all kinds of very heavy loads. So you, w- you wouldn't even notice a five pound weight shift most of the time. Um, but when you start adding the cumulative effect of that, so it's back to this cumulative trauma model we talked about earlier, um, then, you know, if you're doing your 10,000 steps per day, which is 5,000 on each foot, well, then a five pound weight shift is 5,000 times five pounds, right? So 250,000 pounds of extra load through one leg. And that's just doing your average daily walking. That's not running around playing a football match or doing day by day training, or, you know, imagine a runner going out every day for, for 5k or 10k. The cumulative effect of that across time is, you know, even across a year is literally millions of tons of extra load through one leg. And so again, this idea of cumulative stress, cumulative trauma comes in there. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's something that, uh, that I think is important to have an understanding of. And particularly if you are injured, you should see someone who, who has an understanding of that rather than just go straight to the hamstring or to the ankle or the knee or whatever it is. You really want to have someone who's looking at the whole kinetic chain, including these various neurological factors such as somatic reflexes and optic and otic occlusal plane reflexes, those kinds of things. Otherwise, you're not really likely to find the etiological or the causative pathway. So that the etiological just means the causative uh, pathway for that injury. So this is why you might just keep getting recurrent hamstring strains or recurrent ankle sprains or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that does that does that more or less yeah. cover what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. So quite often on this podcast, Matt, I ask people to share what their top three tips might be. But I'm just aware of, for this subject, it's pretty difficult to narrow it down <laughs> to three. What would perhaps be your kind of over overview in terms of advice for someone? They could be a professional athlete listening to this podcast. They could be someone that plays football on a Sunday afternoon, let's say. And mm. they've either got a hamstring strain now and they're not getting resolution to it, or perhaps they think, mm. well, I definitely don't want to be getting a hamstring injury because I want to reach my potential. Yeah. What would be like a quick overview of key points of things that you would recommend they do to either prevent getting a hamstring injury or, or to help rehabilitate a hamstring injury? Well, I mean, it, it really does start from, from uh, digestion in many ways, you know, getting the digestion right. That's absolutely key. And, 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 you know, that's for many different reasons, uh, you know, outside of what we talked about today. But, but um, I think probably one of the most common drivers of, of hamstring injury is, is the core not working optimally, the transverse abdominus and multifidus. So, of course, you, you can activate those muscles. You can work on those muscles if you know how to do that or find someone who can tell you how, teach you how to do that. Um, but that will only be so effective um and you know unless you uh actually work with the, the nutrition and get the, the gut health right and the organ health right so i think organ health is is absolutely fundamental to all of this 
Um, obviously, we mentioned this obviously go to occlusal plane reflex thing. That's quite specialized. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to address on your own. So, But I think nutrition and lifestyle is, is absolutely key to optimize that healing rate um, and to optimize your core function. Then once you've got your gut and your organs functioning well, then it's doing the core stability or motor control type conditioning, I would say, um, which kind of includes you know, a lot of that often is done on the floor. It's often done using Swiss balls or BOSUs, you know, various devices, blood pressure cuffs or biofeedback devices. So that's all great um, and, and important. But then the next thing after that is it's, it's absolutely critical to take that work from on the floor or on the table or on the, on, on the uh, Swiss ball into functional movement patterns. And I think if you can do that, then what you're going to be doing is uh, you're not only minimizing risk of, of hamstring injury, but also optimizing your, your performance and minimizing risk of all injuries. Um, but yeah, you're then reintegrating that isolated work that you've done um, and bring it back into functional movement patterns, which which is often what's missing from rehabilitation protocols, e- even still today, just looking at the papers I was looking at earlier. There's there's no mention of sling systems. There's no mention of, you know, sort of um, looking anywhere beyond the low back. And even, even one of them, I just, like I say, I looked at three papers. Um, they're all kind of meta-analyses, so summarizing the research, and they're all from 2022 or 2023. And only one of them mentioned the core which I thought was surprising. Two of them uh, mentioned the sacroiliac joint, but none of them mentioned the core and the sacroiliac joint. <laughs> and and, uh, and none of them mentioned the sling systems and how it all interrelates. None of them mentioned the viscera and the organs and how they can affect things and so on. So, so there's still a long way to go in the published literature, I'd say. Um, but, you know, obviously, ultimately, if you can find someone who understands this kind of way of working, which, um, you know, I hate to sound like a, a broken record, but that, that's what we do as check practitioners, then, then that would be probably an optimal way to go about both treating and preventing uh, a hamstring injury. It's a shame there's not a uh, soccer biomechanics manual, isn't there? <laughs> Funny you should say that. <laughs> no, so uh, yeah, that has been an idea for, for, for many a year, but yeah. um, one of those that's just uh, never been completed, let's yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting considering yeah. what my next question is, Matt. What's that? What's next for you, Matt? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I could do a soccer biomechanics manual. Um, but um, no, actually, I mean, what is on the card? I, in fact, last time I was on, I think I was saying I'm going to relaunch uh, my podcast, mm. which is still on the cards. And I've got an idea for that. So I've got a, got a new idea, which I think might actually make it um, quite interesting. So, so that is re-enlivened again I, I stopped my podcast when covid kicked off really um uh, you know to sort of invest my time in in uh trying to understand what was going on there um but um but so that is definitely on the cards um i'm working on uh paul check's latest offering or upcoming offering which is called spirit gym it's a a book about the idea that we live in a gym for spirits and everything everything in life is a uh, challenge to some greater or lesser degree and we can either instantly overcome that challenge just like go into a gym and pick up a light weight you can pick that up no problem but then you pick up a heavier weight and it's like oh that's a bit of a problem you might need someone to help you pick it up you might need someone to teach you the technique for doing it um uh, or you just might not be able to do it for a while you might need to train up to be able to overcome that challenge mm. and that's the idea of spirit gym is that that life is a gym for spirits and we uh we have to or we have the choice let's say to to uh develop ourselves to overcome those those resistances and those challenges that are thrown our way so that's paul's upcoming book so, so, um so paul will be coming on this podcast to talk about that by the way right yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, well that's going to be deep that's going to be deep so yeah, you're going to have to block, uh, out, block out the whole day for that one <laughs> yeah, yeah very good um yeah you know and, and then of course you know i i, I guess um I've got several other projects that I'm working on, um, but uh, but but I, I'll probably I'll probably keep them up my sleeve for now, um, just because I don't want to over promise and under deliver. <laughs> but um, the, the focus at the moment is is Spirit Gym and getting this uh, this podcast back up and running. So yeah, great, awesome. And and where can people find you online? Oh, online I'm at mattswalden.com. So it's Matt with two T's, Walden with two L's, D E N, Walden. Um, and uh yeah so that's my my website obviously i'm on most of the social media uh well i'm not 
I'm not on it a lot, but I, I, I will tend to respond sometimes, you know, within a day, sometimes within a week. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's probably the best place to find me. And on social media, you're Matthew Warden, right? Uh, I think I'm Matthew Warden on, uh, on Facebook. I think I'm Matt Warden on Twitter. Um, I forget what I am on LinkedIn, but you'll, you'll find me, I'm sure. I wouldn't know. In fact, I'm wearing this jumper on a lot of my profiles, I realised as I came on today. So it's like the perfect uh, kind of, uh, you know, primer for people to find me. <laughs> I, I don't know too much about LinkedIn these days since they deplatformed me. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for, for, uh, for talking the truth <laughs> exactly that exactly yeah, that yeah. so uh yeah i'm i'm not on there i was going to say mm. unfortunately but it's not but yeah not not that yeah. not that concern well mm. matt always happy to have you back if uh, you know you've got some big projects coming up that you want to launch and discuss and things so you're always always Thanks, welcome Lee. to come back that's great thank you appreciate it but yeah matt Thanks again for coming on and uh, you know sharing your your wisdom with the, with the audience. I'm sure you know everyone everyone's going to love it. Like you know the previous episodes that you did, now they always get tons of downloads. So uh, I'm sure cool. I'm sure lots of people are going to listen to this one. Fantastic! All right, that's great. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Uh, I'll pleasure. see you soon. So that's all from Matt and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review and I'll see you next time.